All right, we'll go ahead and get started here tonight as people are finding their place. And the notes on the back are not new, so if you grabbed them last week, you should be able to pick up where we left off. We we're on, I think it's, yeah, page eight of your notes there. And we had just kind of, again, kind of in God's sovereignty, cool how it worked out, just started on the relationship of purity and talked about pure in heart. I didn't plan it that way, but it works out well, so... We'll pick up there here this evening with that discussion. And then this will finish out chapter four in the book and we'll plan to go to chapter five next week and print new notes for that. And then this week there should have been an email that went out so that if you want a PDF copy and once we get all the way through to, I'll make sure that we have copies of the full notes that go out in case people want those or missed a session and Uh, want to have that. So as we begin here, I'll open us in a word of prayer and we'll get back into the study here. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity this evening to gather together in your house. And we just uh, thank you for these truths and just the opportunity to be encouraged um, by your word one with another. And so Lord, we just pray that our hearts would be drawn near to you and that they would be washed and challenged through the word. And we just Thank you for this opportunity to gather tonight and to study together. Pray that you would just bless our time and our fellowship together around your word. And we pray and ask these things in your name. Amen. So as we pick this back up and we look at what chapter four was discussing, our union or relationship with Christ, and focused on basically three aspects of this in chapter four in the notes here that I wanted to discuss or walk through in a relationship First of all, of change, which is what the book is really dealing with, a relationship of change in our life, and then a relationship of purity, which is where we'll pick back up tonight, and then we'll also look at a relationship of purpose, and these are all things that are found in our ultimate relationship with Christ. And so as we we think about this relationship of purity, you know, we talked last time and we looked, I think, at Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and talked about how in this current day and age, we're basically in a state of preparing as Christ's bride, the church, for the one day union with Christ, the one day marriage. And so just as in the earthly example or illustration of somebody who's engaged, they're preparing for marriage, in a Christian belief belief and worldview, you would be keeping yourself pure for your spouse, for your mate. And you would be, there would be an emphasis and a focus upon purity leading up to the wedding. And so Really, that's kind of the emphasis that we're placing here or that the scripture is putting here on the believer and the church as well. Preparing for the one day union with Christ with a focus on purity here and now. And so I think in the notes it says this, in light of this picture or illustration, the focus of our life now becomes not upon personal happiness, but upon our spiritual purity. And I think, you know, we sometimes get the impression that that's one at the expense of the other. In other words, that if you're focusing on purity, we won't be happy. And yet, as we've looked at going through the Beatitudes, the truly happy or blessed are the ones that are ha- have an emphasis and a focus on purity or holiness. And as we start here, just turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. I want us to look at this picture together. This kind of also ties in with this morning. We didn't get a chance to go there, but I think it fits well to pick up tonight with this discussion. If you didn't get notes, looks like Ryan printed off or copied off some more there. So if you need if you need a copy of the notes for tonight, you can make eye contact with him there in the back. But Ephesians chapter five, and you look at verse. 25, this whole passage and section here is walking through a couple different dynamics and relationships and dealing with our walk as a believer. And you get to verse 25 there and it says, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So you get this picture here again, where he's specifically giving us that exact illustration of just as 
in the marriage, you're keeping yourself pure here, Christ and the church. And you notice what it says there in verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, excuse me, end of verse 26 there, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So we didn't really get to this this morning, but in talking about even that purification process, the role of the word, Psalm 119 touched on this, but here in Ephesians, you see the word directly mentioned as well as part of that purifying in our life, being washed with the word and our obedience and our response and our interaction with the word there. And just kind of a personal question of reflection that's in your notes, but I think it's, um, you know, a, a good challenging one for us in my own life, in each of our lives, for us to think through. And again, even as it ties in with the discussion this morning, what are the things in our life, in your life, that are enticing us away from faithfulness to the Lord and our relationship with the Lord? They're enticing us to be unfaithful. They're pulling us away. I think it's always good to take fairly regular inventory on something like that because those things can be sneaky in our life and they may not package themselves as outright blatant sin when they arrive on your doorstep. But as you get involved in them, they can be things that are enticing and you, upon evaluation, upon spiritual reflection, you realize, hey, this is impacting my faithfulness to the Lord. It's impacting my relationship with the Lord. It's hindering or enticing me into things that would affect my purity in my relationship with the Lord. And so that gets back to what we talked about this morning too, of cutting out, mortifying, or putting to death these things that can be illegitimate pleasures, things that pull us away from Christ. And so I think that's something that we can kind of learn in our walk and relationship with Christ that's good to examine on a regular basis because sometimes, again, those things kind of sneak up or change on us through time and as we go through life. And in the book, he had this quote, and it said, he said, we worship what we find attractive. And so in light of that, I want to do this too. Let's turn to, your notes should have this, turn to Joshua chapter 7. And I want to just look, we won't look at the entirety of this, but again, because it ties in well here with the chapter in the book, but also then with our discussion this morning, I think this is a good example to look at. And most of us are familiar with this story and account, the story of Achan, and it comes right on the heels of the Battle of Jericho. And if you look at just the background to that, in Joshua chapter 6, here's the direct instruction that gets uh, violated here. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. And then verse 18, And you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the specific instruction that's given in the battle of Jericho that everything else is accursed. Don't touch it. Don't be enticed by it. Don't grab it. Don't take it. And so we get into the reality then of the this, this story in the, of the person of Achan and what he decides to do here in chapter 7. And so when you think about this and you break it down before we look at it, you know, what is the sin of Achan? What is Achan's sin? Yeah, Craig? Uh, Good. So he coveted. He stole, he disobeyed. Yep. Anything else you would add there as you think about the process here that happens in Achan's life and this sin that we examine here? Kathy? Discontentment. Okay, discontentment. Yep, good. Good, so there's also some dissatisfaction, discontentment, dissatisfaction, a lack of treasuring Christ or contentment in Christ there. Un unthankfulness, I guess, too, is kind of what Dwayne's saying there. Anything else that comes to your mind here about how this happens in Aiken's life and really then by comparison even in our own life? Okay, good. So, uh, right, after the sin, 
You know, and, and you wonder there, I mean, there's a lot that goes on in our heart and life there. I don't know if it's totally guilt over what happened or the wrongdoing or if it's just, again, part of the conniving or scheming that hoping time passes and he can find a way to go back to it and make value or use of it. But as we stir our thoughts that way, just look at then at a few of these verses together. Again, most of us are familiar with this account. Joshua then sends out spies into the land. They say, hey, we shouldn't have any trouble defeating this, taking this land over. Don't send the whole army. And they go, and it starts off extremely poorly. They're getting routed. They pull back. Joshua then is distressed, realizes, hey, something is going on here. Something has happened. And if you look and you pick up this account then in chapter 7, It's after kind of Joshua's distress. You look at verse 12 there. It says, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord, There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. That's very strong language, but I also think that's what makes this story so vivid, so impactful in our own life, that this is taken very seriously. And they're saying, you know, get, get rid, destroy the accursed from among you. And I think this language is good in light of the purity of our own life. There should be nothing that we wouldn't consider cutting ties with immediately if it was impacting the purity of our relationship with Christ. But to think that aggressively is difficult, especially if we're wandering into sin, if we're beginning to go down a path that is also involving blindness in our own life. But then there's that command there in verse 13 to sanctify the people. And I always find it, you know, interesting as you, as you kind of begin to picture this scene in your own mind and you think about the way it's set up, and to think about being Achan and to wonder, was there any doubt in his mind that, or any belief in his heart that he would get get out of this, you know, that when they're going to describe, here's what we're going to do tomorrow, we're going to walk through this, you know, tribe by tribe, then family by family, then household by household, then man by man, and to think through that process and to feel that beginning to happen and to think, you know, did Achan know as soon as they started whittling it down that this was on its way directly to him? Or was he hoping that somehow there would be a glitch in this deciphering and dwindling down? But to think through that I think is impactful because when we are getting close to being caught in our own sin, there's that same feeling. And the lengths that we may go to and the feeling of the weight of that sin. But as you look at this in, in verse uh, 19... You skip ahead there, and they do exactly that. They get it all the way down to Achan, and Joshua then approaches him, and he says, Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And again, there's language, spiritual language for us as well. Confession, not hiding our sin, not withholding anything, not leaving anything out, not holding anything back, not twisting the details all things that we can struggle with in our confession before the Lord and being truly repentant. And verse 20 there, it says, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted. Then I took them, and there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So as you look at those verses, what do you notice in Achan's confession and in the progression that happens in his life? What are, I mean, at least three things there that stick out to you from his confession? Because really, he's giving you the process to how it works really in, our, in all of our lives with this enticement. What's the first thing that Achan says happened? <laughs> he saw it. Yep, the first thing he says right there is he saw, and then what's the next thing? He coveted, yep, and then what happens? Then he took it, yep. And so when you think about this, there's the progression of sin in our own life in a similar way, that he sees it, he covets, he wants it, and then he takes it, he acts on it. There's the temptation, there's the turning then in the heart and of the head, and 
I've heard, um, as this was being preached, a couple things that stick out to me. I wrote these phrases in my Bible, what turns our head turns our heart. And I think that's very true. And you see that here with Achan, what turns his head turns his heart. And I think we think about that in our own life. That's really going along with what he says in the book that we worship what we find attractive. So think about what is that? What is it that we find attractive? Because we, with our heart, with our life, with our time, will find a way to worship and engage um, with that. So here, same is true. If something's turning our head, catching our attention and our eyes and our glance, causing us to ponder, to think, then it's turning our heart. And that's what you see happen as he thinks upon this. He was given the same instruction. He knew the instruction, but as he sees it, begins to think about it, it then causes this coveting in his heart. That coveting leads to the taking. And so this also shows the other reason for us to be aggressive with, in dealing with our sin, that we understand that this process, we all like to think that just understanding how sin works or whatever, that we'll be strong enough to resist it, to cut it off. We can see its schemes, but sometimes that involves taking action so that we're not even messing around with the saw level, what we're seeing. We're guarding that gate because really it's foolish to make it in or to think that, okay, you know, I mean, I don't need to protect that so much. I'll just make sure I don't covet or that I don't take the end result. But the reality is we should be aggressive enough in our life and with sin that we think, okay, hey, I need to protect my eye gate, what's happening here, and that the reality of seeing and coveting in our life. And oftentimes we can think just in terms of lust or sexual sin, but this is a reality in, in all areas of our life um, when it comes to other sins we may struggle with as well. And I think as you also think about this, the reality of what happens here for Achan, and, and just kind of to finish it off, in verse 24 there, it says, Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkey, his sheep, his tent, all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire. And after they had stoned them with stones, and so you just see there again, aggressive, sobering language with how they dealt with this. But again, I think it's a picture of, it's meant to be, it is a picture of dealing with sin in our own life. In the camp of Israel, in reality, real life, real people, real sin, real stealing here, real coveting and taking. But this is all spiritual reality in our own life. And so it's meant to be a vivid illustration and the importance of sanctification, the importance of purity. And another a phrase that I've written in my Bible that I just think captures this well because it's true of us as it was true of Achan. Achan got what he want, but he lost what he had. And that's often how sin works in our life as well. We can covet something, we can fix our eye and the desires of our heart and upon it, and we may attain it. Unfortunately, oftentimes we do. We do in our sin. You think about that. What we covet, if we get to that stage of coveting something in our life, we often do end up attaining it one way or another. But the reality is we also then usually lose something. We lose out. Uh, we always do. We always lose something. And here you see that illustrated very vividly that Achan got what he wanted. But if you ask him, was it worth it? You don't even have to ask the question. You know, he loses everything. He loses everything he had, his life, his family, all of it gone. And we often don't think about the cost when this process takes hold, when we get placed onto this conveyor belt of sin and it draws us and pulls us in, the last thing on our mind is often the consequences and what it's going to cost us when we think about sin. So as, as we tie that in, even with this morning, and you think about blessed are the pure in heart, I think these are good passages to incorporate and to think about in that. That's part of our active role in the purity of our life is that willingness to, on a regular basis, basis, ask ourselves questions like this, examining our own heart and finding what is it that may be enticing us away from our relationship with the Lord. Um, and, I, and I think another way of illustrating it too is for those who are sports fans and, you know, football fans, you see a lot of talk and discussion in the game of football about disguising blitzes and coverages. And so that it confuses an offense. People want to hide what a defense is doing and disguise where the blitz is coming from. That has a lot to do, I think that illustrates too what happens in our spiritual life. There's really nothing new. It's just the reality that our adversary is out there at times, sometimes disguising his coverages. 
and trying to make it look a little different so that we don't see where it's coming from, where the pressure is coming, where we're going to be sacked and taken down is the football analogy. And I think that's true in our own life spiritually as well, that there's really nothing new. It's just disguised coverages, disguised blitzes. Where is it coming from? We may not see it coming and it blindsides us and it takes us down. And the reality is the strategy is very much the same. It's just being dressed up, disguised differently. But as we think about that too, I think in your notes, it has James 1.14, which is a great verse for talking about that, that process that we see here in Joshua. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And you guys mentioned it before we looked at it. There's the depth of everything that's happening. It is covetousness, but it's also a lot more that happens in our life when we find ourselves in, in that position. And, and it is interesting. Maybe you, maybe you have thoughts on this. Sometimes we can think that we are satisfied in Christ until something is put in front of us that entices us. And I, I think that can be true. You know, I haven't thought through that at length, but there's, there's a lot that goes on, the, the importance of being prepared and on guard, spiritually speaking. But any thoughts on this here that you would add or that as you've gone through this or maybe studied this, but just in general when it comes to relationship of purity and dealing with our sin, any comments there that you would add? All right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. It's very worth highlighting and clarifying because it is true. And I think that's what becomes craftier, deceiving for us at times as we grow in Christ is that, you know, we can think, yeah, but that's not a sin. But as Vaughn is pointing out, it can become one when it deals with coveting, pulling our heart away, replacing time, priority shifting because of something that maybe was amoral or you know, not bad, but became something that really went into that category of an idol of the heart and an idol of our, our life. But yeah, any other thoughts or comments on this? And as always, you know, if something comes to your mind as we go, you can flag me down here as we take these breaks. But if not, you can flip your notes there then to the other side and think through, we want to use the remainder of our time to get through page eight or yeah, it'll be page nine for you guys, I believe in your notes. And this is where he deals with the relationship of purpose. And I also think this is, you know, re really important, very good information that he walks us through as it relates to change. And I think very pertinent and needed today. There are many that become discouraged, depressed with life and, and as you think about that, you know, let's start with that just to get your thoughts on this. We can walk through life. There can be people, and there are, there are people all around us right now, people that you know, that you're friends with, that you work with, that are discouraged or depressed with life. And that almost always is going to come back to feeling like, what's the purpose? What's the point? I don't, I don't see the value in the day. I don't see the hope. I don't see the joy. So as you think about this, what are ways in which a relationship with Christ brings purpose into our everyday life? Because I think this is a broad answer too. It's a full answer. And so just to name or to think through a few, what comes to your mind when you think through that? What are ways in which our relationship with Christ brings purpose to each day? And we're going to look at some of these, but before we do, what are things? Yeah, Marilyn. Remember messages um, where the pastor refers to being ambassadors and being alert to how we can share Christ and share Christ during that time. 
All right, good. So we're Christ's messengers. We're Christ's ambassadors. The opportunity to show Christ the love and life of Christ to others each day. Yeah, Bill. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, certainly the eternal truths and hope, yeah, give purpose and weight to each day. What else comes to your mind? If not, we'll, yeah, Tim. Years back, just said we're over, we're overwhelmed with life because we're underwhelmed with God. Yeah, that's good, a good way of putting it. We're we are overwhelmed with life because we are underwhelmed with God. And you know, I think about this again in a family setting with young kids. You see this play out on a regular basis, where especially when you get to the weekend and. There's not school and the normal structure and beat of the week. Your kids, they inevitably are going to ask you, you know, what are we doing today? They want to know the schedule so that they know that that day has purpose, <laughs> that it holds something of value or purpose to them. And you don't have to wonder what they think of your plans for the day. They're going to literally show you by their reaction to what you tell them or what you give them. And you say, well, here's what we're doing today or here's what we thought we would do today. And they are... All they are doing is taking all that information and sifting it for happiness and joy. And if they don't see anything on that list that provides that for them, it's like the shoulders are going to drop, the countenance is going to drop, the eyes are going to roll. They're looking for purpose in a day. And, you know, oftentimes I think life can feel very much like that, even for us as Christians and believers. And so it is a, a big deal when it comes to finding our purpose. Our purpose is much deeper and grander and broader than we often so so easily narrow it down to in life. And so you think, I think this is in your notes there as well. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That is very much a statement of purpose in Christ. And so as you think about that, what comes to your mind? What is he saying when he says old things have passed away? What are the old things? What fits into that category of old things that have passed away? So this is really, our, yeah, our purpose in Christ uh, changed. Changed. but Steve, what? No, 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 no. I'm, yeah, I'm just saying that like, yeah, he's telling us that old things, this is talking about that change in purpose in life. When we come to Christ, the old things have passed away. All things that Certainly old, old desires, old habits, old patterns, Tim. I was, I was an enemy of Christ. I, w I was facing the wrath of God. And, and it, when I was justified and redeemed, those things were taken away. And now brought in. He made me alive. I was dead. That's passed away. Mm -hmm. My habits haven't changed yet. That will come. But it's, it's more of my standing before God. That old person is gone. And now I stand complete. Okay, good. Yeah. Yep. Vonda?
Yeah, no, it does good. I'm going to come back to that as well because I think that's, I, I, I believe that's part of this verse as well. But any other thoughts? Yeah, Allison? Yeah, good. Courtney? Um, and a few verses before that, the book previously touched on this verse in verse 15 that says, He died well so that those who live to live no longer for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. And then a quote that correlated with that verse from the book was, God's love comes into your life to change what you live for. Yeah, good. Good, yeah. So right there in the context, you can see some of what Vonda and Allison were saying there too. Yep. Any other thoughts on this? Or even to open the discussion further, you know, is there anything that can be added from describing what has become new? We're, we're touching on it a little bit, but if you have thoughts on either, the old things have passed away, what are those old things? All things have become new. What, what are the things that become new to us? Anything else you would add to the discussion there? Yeah, Trent. Yeah, good. I, to give the fullness of the picture here, I think scripture does this with us often with these deep and rich truths that, you know, as, as the discussion has all brought out, you know, Tim was highlighting the things that were a reality in our justification. When, when that regeneration, that new birth took place, you know, it was the wrath of God that was satisfied. It was the penalty of sin that was paid for us. We were made new. But also I think it is fair to say, these other things, these are the aspects, even if they're not a real reality in the sense of we have apprehended and attained the level at our salvation, scripture gives us those pictures so often where it says all, you've been given all things you need for life and godliness. These positional truths are true even if we spend our life in that sanctification process attaining what actually is already ours, what's already available. So I think this is also touching on that same thing. The old things that are passing away, behold, all things have become new. This is a statement of purpose for the rest of our life as a believer, that we are going to spend the rest of our life exploring the things that are passing away and fading into the rearview mirror and the things that are being made new. I mean, I think we could really live this verse out in, in incremental stages in our life. And what I mean is you could testify to 
things over different periods of your life that you're, you were finding to be passing away, not as important as they used to be, being made new and seeing the newness and the freshness. Things that are new always bring with it an excitement. And I think that's also what fuels our relationship with Christ is things are always being made new to us. There's excitement because, man, wow, look what I, I just, I never saw this before. This is new. And the reality is it's not new, but it's new to us. You know, it's new to that journey that we're on in our relationship with Christ. And that's the awesome part about all of this. And I think that's why it is fundamental and foundational to this relationship of purpose. And I think in your notes there, you have that quote from the book that again, I think goes right with this statement from scripture because the Christian life is built upon the foundation of facing who you really are and trusting who Christ really is. Facing the reality of who we are and those old things that we want to pass away, the reality of who we were, putting that in the distance, distancing ourselves from it, from it and making things become new, trusting Christ for who he truly is, discovering that and being on that journey. And so much of what you guys said highlighted all of that. Now, now turn to Philippians. I think this will this will be the last scripture here that we look at and examine together. But Philippians chapter three, and I I like this passage as well when it comes to this reality of purpose in Christ, and just just starting with this list that Paul gives in verses four through nine, before we look at. 10 and 11, but if you just start there in Philippians chapter 3, Saul, Saul, who becomes Paul, is giving you this testimony in his life of really what 2 Corinthians 5, 17, excuse me, is talking about. He's giving you his own personal testimony of that, of saying, here's the old things of Saul, here's how I viewed them after coming to Christ. And in verse 4, he says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And so you, you, you start there, stop there, look at these verse, a couple of verses here together. You think about what Paul is describing here, and he's really saying in that list that he gives, these are the things previously, prior to coming to Christ, that he boasted in, he found his self-confidence in, and really, ultimately, then you can say he found his identity in. These were the things that made Saul who he was. And these were what he would view at as his strengths, and not just his strengths, but who he became. It's what he took his, his what's, what he prided himself in. And then he comes to Christ and he realizes all of that has changed. And not only has it all changed, but now what he saw before as his identity, his strengths, the things he would have boasted about before Christ, he now saw them in a new light and he realized not only are those not my strengths, not my identity, and not what I boasted anymore, now those are placed in this new column of an obstacle. They're now becoming a hindrance because it's what my flesh wants to glory in. It's what my flesh thinks its identity is. And so those things become then an obstacle to the reality of pursuing Christ. The old things that needed to pa be passed away, to be done with, to be put behind us, they can become that obstacle to the life of Christ because the life of Christ, as we've seen in our study in the morning, is calling us to be poor in spirit. These things stood in Paul's way of being poor in spirit. It's what he boasted in. It's what he took pride in. And he's recognizing in Christ, it has to be put away. It has to, he has to be, as he seeks to leave behind serving himself, living for himself, he recognizes how these things need to sh change. The, the perspective needs to be shifted in these. And if you look there specifically at verse seven, he says, but what things were gain to me, these I have counted loss. I think something that can be helpful in describing that shift in purpose and change is I kind of label 7a, the first part of that verse, as deceit. And then the second part as discernment. 
what things were gained to me. That's, that's the deceit of sin. These things were gain, you know. I, I, I had the privilege of being the best of the best and the schooling and the education I received and how I was born into this world. But he's, really, that's under the category of deceit now that he has come to Christ. And then he says, those I counted lost for Christ. That's discernment that God brings into our life to say, now I recognize how those really impact my own walk with Christ. And what is really changing this perspective, and that's where you get into him realizing the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. And these things stood in the way of that. They stood in the way of him really coming to know the life of Christ. And this was also, you know, made clear to me as we were over there at, at faith and our years at, at the school there, because it's so easy in our college years of life. And many of us can still remember what that feels like to have gone into our college years and to be thinking, okay, now career is ahead of me. And I got to decide what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Just by nature of that time in our lives, we can think very much in terms of Saul, <laughs> those things that are gained to me. How am I gifted? What are my strengths? What do I want to do with the rest of my life? We can easily you know, have life sneak us into this category of taking how God made you, who you are, and using it to serve self. And our world is becoming more crafty and more deceitful and pushing our kids to do that to get into the best schools, to have the best education, to throw your money into this so that you can, it's not just, I want to study law. What's the best school to do it? It's not just, I want to practice this. What's the best school to do that? What's going to bump you to the head of the line? These things aren't necessarily, as we've discussed, wrong or bad in and of themselves. But if we're not aware, again, of how it pulls our heart, of how it turns our head, then they can become an idol. They can become something that take us down a path of making our life. And we can easily forget that God made you who you are. He gifted you in the way he gifted you first and foremost for him, for him, for his glory, for his purpose, whether that's in the church, whether that's in your family, in your home, in your workplace, but it's first and foremost for him. And we need to continue to preach and teach that and share that with one another because that is a deceitful way in which we are shifting in our high school, teen, college, career, ages, and years of life. It's becoming something that's far too easy. I mean, I had discussions with guys where, you know, you sat down and you're just like, where's God in this equation? Yes, I don't disagree with you that God's gifted you. He's given you a mind for this. Your creative juices flow in this way, and God may want to use that. But where are you also using that for him first and foremost? We're not giving, because think about how... <sighs> how foolish that is that we say basically with our life, Lord, thank you for making me this way. I'm now going to use it to make the most money to serve myself as I possibly can. And I know I'm overstating it that way, but in our hearts, that sometimes becomes the shift that we, we can easily walk down in life. We can lose the, the purpose as God lays it out, as God's word lays it out for us. And as, when that happens, we really begin to lose the joy in our life because we're not seeing the blessing that comes from God bestowing, making us a certain way, using it then for his purpose, for his glory in life. And our identity becomes, and, and that's why I think these verses are so critical because Paul's laying that out so clearly. He's saying, look, this is who I was. And, and I mean, I don't doubt for a second then that Paul used all of those things. He put that education to good work, first and foremost, for Christ. Like he used all of these things, but he had to die to the self-glory and vanity that comes from these things so that he could serve Christ in a way in which God could really get glory from who he, who he made Paul to be, how he gifted or how he worked. And so you can even put this into our marriage, our, our family. We can easily give our family our leftovers in life. You know, we can spend ourselves and our talents and our gifts and who God made us. And by the time we get home, there's not much left of the gifts of who we are for our family. You know, our engaging personality, our sense of humor, whatever it is in the way, in the things that God has made us. And all of a sudden that's dried up by the time we make it home and our family gets the leftovers. In that same way, it can picture what we do with God, that we can give God the leftovers of our life. We can think about him well down the list of priorities. And so, if you look at kind of what it says there in the notes too, I think some convicting questions as we think about this and we tie this into our, our life here and 
you look now at what it says there in verses 9 and 10, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. That's what that whole category Paul saw as. These are things that just contributed to my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So before I kind of close out with some comments there, just pause for a moment. Any thoughts or comments on that? Things that come to your mind there as we walk through this? Yeah, Jan. I don't know if I can put this to words, but in our old nature, um, the one who passed away was always like, self-elevating and, and you're always like comparing to one another and the new nature, the playing field is completely even because you're all in Christ. You're literally putting on Christ and it's him who's perfect and you're just not even points anymore, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It is a verse that basically says that exactly and I, I, the reference is escaping me, but it says, you know, we're neither Jew nor Gentile, but basically one in Christ. I think that's Paul's writing too, but yeah. Any other thoughts here as we bring this to a close here tonight? Well, just a couple things then as we wrap this up and you think about those verses there, what things to take with us, um, you know, I, in the, in the notes there, I think you have this written out that if one of us stood up here and we tried to explain, and most of us are at a place where we know each other fairly well, but if you, if you stood up here and you explained to, or even we're in a crowd and, and there are people that you just were introduced to and you explained to them your spouse and the things that are, or one of your best friends and you're ta telling them everything that's important, they can hear these stories and they can learn this truth about your friend, your spouse, but even if you could, even if it was possible to tell them everything you know, they still don't know your friend or your spouse like you do. Why? Because they don't have the fellowship of life. And here Paul's using specifically the word fellowship of sufferings. They haven't walked through this together. There are things that with your best friend or your family member or certainly your spouse where you have laughed together, cried together, walked through difficulty, rejoiced, struggled together, whatever it is, you've gone through the pains, the joys, the highs, the lows of life together. And that's a fellowship that you can't verbally transfer to anybody else. And that's really too what Paul is hitting at here. When that, when that happens, when we begin to know Christ in those way and, ways and fellowship with him in that manner, it certainly brings purpose to our life and the reality that we begin to see to build on the question we began with, some ways in which our relationship with Christ brings purpose to our life, some really meaningful and impactful ways then become, and these are so important because we're seeing this happen more and more in life. You know, we can picture our life, whether we would verbally say this or not, like it is the board game and we can hit, you know, a point in this, in this life where we lose our job, uh, we lose a spouse, we're divorced. We, life takes a crazy, hard, sudden turn. And the reality is apart from Christ, it can feel like, what do I do now? Maybe that was our identity more than we thought, more than we realized, and what do I do now? And the reality that Christ is pointing us to is there's never the dead end in, in God's game and purpose for you and for I. There's never a corner where all of a sudden we, we hit that and he's like, well, you're stuck there. I don't know what to tell you now, and I can't do anything there. That never happens with Christ. That never happens in our relationship with God. There is no dead end. There is no, you know, spot where we find ourselves and we're stuck and we lose a turn <laughs> or we're stuck there until the game shifts or changes in our favor again. The reality in Christ is there's always purpose. There's fellowship in the sufferings of life. There's, this is the walk of faith to build spiritual memorials to put mileage in our spiritual walk with Christ. And I think that is also so important for our world to see and hear today because these are the things that really become very discouraging, heavy, depressing realities in life where it's not the life they dreamed anymore. 
what they pictured, what they set their mind on, what they endeavored to achieve, all of a sudden it's taken away, it's cut off, it changes. And we think you can genuinely struggle with what do I do now? What's next? And in Christ and our relationship with him, it always has purpose because old things are passing away. All things are becoming new. And I think the ultimate statement that then ties in with that is 2 Corinthians 4. It should be in your notes as well. Verse 16, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. That is a statement of purpose for each and every day of our life, spiritually speaking. That is a statement of purpose that can't be trumped by what happens. Life can take the craziest and the most depressing and wrong turn, but that statement of truth holds. God's plan, his purpose for you is that you're being renewed day by day. The outward man can perish. The outward man can make some wrong turns, some crashes in life, some things that don't work out well. They don't, they don't go as we planned. And yet God's plan of inwardly renewing us day by day never changes. It never shifts. It doesn't move. His plan and purpose remains for each one of us in that way that he wants us to hold to that. He wants us to remain resolved in that. And, and just a challenging question there that I put in the notes too, that it's a little bit of a side off of the purpose. But if you think about just that comparison of our relationship with our spouse, our relationship with our family, and as it relates to our, like sometimes the reality of our relationship with our spouse, we can feel that. We can feel the tension. We know when things aren't right. We know when things are good. We, we can't escape that. With our relationship with Christ, we can deceive ourselves a little bit better. We can pretend a little easier that things are fine. And so I think in, in some ways, it's a, it's a good question to ask ourselves, what if all of a sudden the nature of our relationship with the Lord became the nature of our relationship with our spouse? In other words, the health of your relationship with the Lord all of a sudden was the health of your relationship with your spouse. Would our marriage be on the rocks all of a sudden? Would it be a difficult and bumpy relationship? Would we, would we feel like we're in the doghouse or, or guilty, so to speak? And making our relationship with the Lord real in those same ways that our relationship with people here are real, thinking in, in those terms of staying current and walking with the same desire of, and, and really so much more because of the, the elevated priority and reality of our relationship with Christ, our relationship with God, and we won't get to that bottom part there. He covers it in the book. Uh, I won't go into that tonight, but it is a good reminder. It's a good warning. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting that he put it in there. You don't often see that, but it is so true. We've given discussion to that in the past. Those are great chapters in Deuteronomy. Uh, the verses that follow ones we've examined a lot already in verses 10 through 20, but also then the entirety of chapter nine, you know, as God's laying out this purpose of, the wilderness wanderings. And then he's getting into the reality of they're going to experience times of prosperity. But in those times of prosperity, that deceit comes in to take, once again, what we've been talking about, to take the gifts that God gives us and all of a sudden to sneak back into the old ways of thinking, yeah, I am pretty smart. Or yeah, God has blessed me in so many ways. It must be because I am such a good person for him. I've been a good servant, a faithful servant of his. And now I'm, it's so deceptive, you know, the way our life, walk, this walk of faith with him, when these good things come, God basically states it matter of factly. He says, when your head is lifted up, this will happen. When your head is lifted up because you can't handle the blessings that I give you. I mean, that's really the reality of it. We can't handle God's goodness. We spoil it and we use it for ourselves. And he's like, when that happens, don't forget this faithful walk of humbling yourself and what God's doing, the purpose that God has in our life. And that's what gives purpose to each day for us, you know, that even the difficulties, the hard things that we would look at as roadblocks, obstacles, depressing realities in our life, God uses to renew the inward man day by day. And that shows us the depths in which God's plan and purpose for our life can't be thwarted. And I think it is it's so, so good to take that, to lift it up and to examine and look at it together, be reminded of these truths because um, we're facing the hard steps and maybe a tough week is ahead of us, tough days, difficult days to be reminded that it's a relationship of change. It's a relationship of purity and we need to be vigilant and aggressive in those, in those regards, but it's certainly a relationship of purpose. God has great purpose for each one of us in and through these things. 
Let's close in prayer. Thanks for your discussion and your attention to this tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for a, a good day to be gathered in your house and to sit under the authority and teaching of your word. Thank you for each one here at Harvest that has taught, that put the time and spent time with you so that they may share these truths with uh, our little kids all the way up to the adults. And Lord, just thank you for the opportunity to sit under the word today and to be a part of that. And Lord, may we posture each one of our hearts under the word and that we may take it with us in the week ahead, that we may see it wash us as we saw from Ephesians, that it may wash us and purify us through the truth and the conviction of your word, Lord. So we thank you for these truths. May our hearts be encouraged and renewed with a perspective of purpose in the week ahead. You have put a purpose in front of each and every one of us this week. Even when life changes and the circumstances change, there's purpose in each and every day with you. And Lord, may we have eyes to see that purpose and certainly uh, Lord, that we may be, leave here with a perspective and a, and a challenge for the purity of our life and the importance of that, to be constantly evaluating with discernment the things of our life for where they are turning our head and pulling our heart away. So Lord, we thank you for this. Thank you for each one that gathered here tonight. And we pray and ask these things in your name. Amen.